amazing. Awesome. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me here at the OWASP May Meetup. So, uh, yeah, my name is Anais. This was an amazing introduction. And this talk, this session is titled Security, Cows Engineering, When and How You Should Break Your System. Just a quick disclaimer, like just mentioned, I used to work in the open source blockchain space, working with distributed ledger technologies and kind of onboarding developers to deploy to uh, blockchain-based environments. Uh, in 2020, at the end of 2020, nearly three years ago, I transitioned to the cloud-native DevOps space, working specifically with Kubernetes. And uh, last year, beginning of 2022, I joined Aqua Security as their open source developer advocate. So I'm fairly new still to anything security related. If you use acronyms, I probably still won't understand you very well. Um, so similarly, this presentation is really focused on making it accessible for everybody to follow along. So some of the slides you might be thinking, oh, I know all of that. And then some other slides might be more interesting for you. So please bear with me. This is really to make it uh, valuable for everybody here. Um, yeah, this is me uh, earlier this year at KubeCon. Uh, who was at KubeCon? Were there people at KubeCon? Kubernetes? No? No? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm heavily in the Kubernetes cloud native space. However, you don't have to know anything related to Kubernetes uh, to follow this presentation. I, I promise. I hope so. Um, anyway, yeah, like mentioned, I have a YouTube channel. I started that when I got started in the cloud native space. And it's just most of the videos are just me sitting down with different open source technologies and showing how I get started with them and complaining about everything that I don't understand. Uh, but there you can also find now there are lots of end-to-end -end tutorials, live streams with different people in the space and similar. I also have a weekly DevOps newsletter that's a combination between DevOps, security, um, and uh, anything that's really going on in the space that I found interesting throughout the week. And I share it on a weekly basis um, to everybody who's subscribing. Uh, I used to be a Cloud Native Computing Foundation ambassador. Um, who here knows the CNCF? Okay, a few people. Yeah, awesome. So the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is part uh, of the Linux Foundation. It's kind of like a subsection of sorts. Um, and they host projects that are related to Kubernetes, that are related to Cloud Native uh, technologies. Uh, so it's all, it's basically um, kind of an entity that provides uh, open source governance that's independent of uh, organizations to these projects that are focused on Kubernetes. Um, I'm also an Open UK ambassador who's here, who has heard of Open UK before? Ah, also a few people, awesome. So Open UK is a fairly new organization, I would say, uh, that's focused on promoting open hardware, open data, open source, and open governance within the UK. So their main focus is really to facilitate communications around those uh, open source technologies and promoting people uh, who are working in this space. And um, yeah, they also host several amazing uh, events and in London and as well as uh, meetups and conferences. So do check them out if you're interested. Um, now let's get into the talk. So I'm going to first focus on different security issues um, that you might find in your uh, cloud infrastructure and your Kubernetes environment. I'm going to focus on misconfigurations as a subsection because we can have lots of different security issues and I want to make my examples throughout the presentation more interesting. So I'm going to focus on misconfiguration security issues and then how security scanners are used to identify misconfiguration and the workflows that we use to implement security scanning into, into our tooling, into our pipelines. Uh, then I will highlight the, uh, the issues that we have currently with security scanners uh, in the space or like the limitations of security scanners and uh, share or go into the learnings that I have from working for nearly a year as site reliability engineer before I joined Aqua Security and how we can apply these learnings and similar from cows engineering to security cows engineering. So first of all, security issues. There are lots of different security issues. Here are some examples of security issues that you'll find in the cloud native Kubernetes space. I've divided them into two categories. So on the left side, you will see security issues that are more static, that are more related to your configuration, to how you set up your different resources. And then, uh, so those are really issues that you can identify at any point when you set up those uh, resources and they're not necessarily dynamically changing versus runtime issues, uh, issues related to your networking policies. Those are more dynamic issues uh, that you would find that you want to identify and you would need different tools for those different types of issues. Now, what are misconfigurations? Who here knows, has an idea of what configura misconfigurations are? 
Hands up. Oh, yeah, if you feel it. Awesome. OK, so whenever you configure anything, uh, you can misconfigure it. So for example, when you set up a new account uh, and you uh, configure, let's say, on Twitter your birthday, you could put in the wrong birthday. Now, that could be perceived as a misconfiguration. When you set up your cloud resources, you're configuring how does cloud resources as opposed to run. So you can see here an example of how you can configure a containerized application uh, to run uh, as a Kubernetes deployment in your cloud infrastructure, in your Kubernetes managed infrastructure. And here I've defined which, on the bottom, bottom left, um, okay, the running work doesn't really work. Um, in the bottom left, I've configured which container image is supposed to run and which version of that container image is supposed to run. Now, I could uh, put here the wrong version and that would be a misconfiguration. Similarly, I could uh, misconfigure um, fields of that configuration file um, that are not compliant with what my company sees as best practices. And then they tell me that is a misconfiguration, not because the industry says so, but because we say so as part of that uh, company. Now, you have in different environments, in different spaces, depending on which tooling you use, which infrastructure components you use, you have different tools that you can use to deploy your application stack. So in a Kubernetes space, we have different templating tools such as Helm charts, customized files. You can write pure YAML manifests uh, for Kubernetes to configure your application, or you can use infrastructure as code tools such as Terraform. Who you used Terraform before? Hey, few people. Awesome. Um, yeah. So whenever you use uh, infrastructure as code tools, you can misconfigure them in the way you run them. Now. Similarly, you could configure your workloads through uh, UIs, web platforms, uh, portals, um, anything online, uh, such as, for example, the AWS portal. You could configure your resources there. Um, and you can click different buttons to configure those resources. Similarly, when you click buttons, you can also misconfigure your resources. Now, I make the distinction here between UI based configurations platforms and code based platforms because the thing is if you have your resources defined as code they are much easier to scan because you have everything laid out of how your application is supposed to look like how is it supposed to run uh, the kind of behavior the kind of resources it's supposed to use in similar versus if you configure resources through a ui it's often much more difficult to identify any misconfigurations of those resources now, in the case of AWS, there are security scanners that can scan your AWS accounts for misconfigurations. Um, however, if you're using smaller tools, smaller platforms and integrate them with your infrastructure, it's likely that they are not integrated with security scanners and it's much more difficult to identify security issues. Now, I'm focusing on misconfigurations because there are lots and lots of misconfigurations out there. And it's actually one, especially in the cloud native space and the Kubernetes space, it's one of the major um, reasons of uh, data breaches and similar um, that you would find that people just misconfigure their resources. So for example, um, this table is taken from 2021 um, database of sorts that I found on GitHub with lots of different uh, misconfiguration examples. So the kind of misconfigurations that happened and then the data uh, that was released, or the amount of data that was released for during because of that misconfiguration, it wasn't identified beforehand. So you have find lots of unsecure S3 buckets that were just accessible um, easily. Then you will find other issues that could have been easily prevented, such as no password protection or any kind of security protecting the database was set up and it exposed over 440 million records. Now, at this point, it's already too late of you as a company to do something to identify the misconfiguration and fix it before the data is released. Um, and that's the point when you can put your email in have I been pound and find out if your email is part of that breach. Who has used have I been pound before? Hey, speak on. Awesome. Yeah, it's it's a tool where you can basically put in your email and you can see if you have been part of a of a security issue, of a data breach, your your personal information. It's awesome. Uh, <laughs> so how do security scanners work and how can they help us? Who has used security scanners before? Hey, lots of people. Awesome. So for those who are new to security scanners, just quickly highlighting how they generally work at a very high level. So security scanner is, for example, a, could be a platform where you connect your different other platforms, your different other accounts to, to scan resources. It can also be a CLI tool that you install or um, 
either locally or in your pipelines. And basically, security scanners take in lots of different information. So for example, they take in uh, known vulnerabilities from different data sources. Um, so they have a list of vulnerabilities. They have lists of frameworks and best practices. So for example, how different environments, different infrastructure resources should be set up, should be defined. Um, there are also different entities that define what are best practices. For example, in a Kubernetes space, we have uh, different compliance guidelines that you can scan your resources for and check if your infrastructure, if the way you set up your infrastructure is compliant to those best practices. Then security scanner also can take in custom information. For, for example, in the case of Aqua Security, we have a research team at Aqua that uh, deploys honeypots and then sees, okay, how about a new kind of exploits that are coming out? And based on their research, the information that they gather, that also feeds into our open source security scanner and into the enterprise security scanner. Now, you will then give the security scanner a resource that it's supposed to scan to identify any, for example, misconfigurations that you have set up. And then it will produce a scan report of like, here is everything that went wrong. And the checks that it will perform is usually like, uh, if you use certain versions of packages, is there a known vulnerability to those packages? Yes or no? In the case of misconfigurations, it will, for example, um, take a look and see, have you defined a specific version for your container image for your application? It's best practice to define a specific version. Is it set? Yes. Okay, the check passes. If it's a no, no, the check fails. And then the failed checks are part of the scan report. Now, at Agri Security, this is the only slide I have, I promise. Uh, we have two main open source projects. You can find them at our GitHub organization. The first one is Trivi. Has somebody here heard of Trivi before? Awesome. So Trivi does everything from file system scanning to container image scanning to scanning your cloud resources. For vulnerability security issues, it can also produce S-bombs and other resources. It's really a versatile tool. Uh, then we have Tracy, which is a runtime security and forensic tool using eBPF. Both tools are completely open source, independent of the enterprise part. Um, you can use it as much or as little as you want. We won't know if you use it or not. Um, so just this is the only slide I have on our tools. Let's continue. So usually when you use a security scanner, your workflow looks something like this. You have the resource similar to the resource that I just showed, like a configuration file where you say, this is my application that's supposed to run. This is the container image where everything is in and I want to run this. Here are the number of instances of the application I want to run in similar. So you set everything up and then you can give it to the security scanner and you can scan it. Um, so you scan the, the resource that you've set up, you trigger the security scanner either manually, locally, or through a CICD pipeline. And then the security scanner will show you, will produce the scan report and will show you the different issues. For example, misconfiguration issues that are identified in that uh, resource that you've given it. And then you can look at all those problems that you've set up and you can start to fix them. That's usually the workflow that you will find. Now, generally, across your system development lifecycle, you will want to do as much of your security scanning as early as possible to identify all the security issues that you might have in there, all the misconfigurations. Because ultimately, the further along you go in developing your application, your stack, uh, the more complex those issues will become and the more difficult they will be to fix um, and to in isolation uh, versus once they are connected with other tools. Uh, so you want to ultimately uh, be proactive in the security scanning. Uh, now, if you do security scanning in your production environments, the workflow might be a bit uh, more versatile, more complicated than going ahead and scanning the resources that you just set up. So for example, if you have your application already running, you will go ahead and configure, for example, a change to the application. Instead of two instances of that application, you have more requests. Uh, you want to run three instances, so it's really you can make sure that um, it has the same kind of response time. So uh, you make the configuration change, and then in response to that configuration change in your running environment, a security scan is triggered. Now the report is produced in your environment, and then based on that report, you can have um, an alerting and observability tool set up that tells you, uh, okay, there's a new critical issue that you've just basically placed into your configuration file, you should really take a look at that. So you can set up this workflow that there are tools in place that if there are new critical issues, new security issues identified, they can notify you about it and you can then hopefully go ahead to look at it and fix it. Now this workflow is generally very proactive on based on the developer, on the person who's deploying actually the change, who's deploying the application. So it's very much, I make a change and then I look at the security 
issues that have been identified. That's usually how security scanners are used. Um, now, how can we ensure that these processes are actually working as expected? Uh, so here's a bit of a timeline, um, <laughs> just showing that I've used to work as site reliability engineer. Um, and in the site reliability engineering space, uh, we did things a little bit different. I've become to realize then when I got started Aqua Security, and I got to work with people who are actually implementing security tools. So this is I will explain the slide. <laughs> so when I was working as SRE, I was working for a small cloud native startup in the UK, and we had quite large um, environments across the globe uh, in different regions. And those environments, those compute racks would run Kubernetes clusters. And then inside of those big Kubernetes clusters that would encompass the compute racks, we would have, we would spin up small tenant clusters, small Kubernetes clusters that our customers were requesting. So we had lots and lots of different components that were moving around and we had to be quite quick to identify if, for example, I tenant cluster, Kubernetes cluster wouldn't spin up the way it was supposed to or anything else was going wrong. It was quite a large scale uh, setup. We had sometimes in some of these regions, we had thousands of tenant clusters that would be running simultaneously. Um, now the workflow that we've set up to implement new tools was something like this, um, that if we decide, okay, we need a new tool, we would go ahead, we do the research and we, we start testing it. We would look into different tools. We would start testing different tools and test different configurations for those tools. Now eventually we would reach a decision of which tools we want to implement. And then we would go ahead and implement a tool in our staging environment that was uh, in kind of um, imitating our production environment. Then from there, we would start to monitor those tools and make sure that everything that's set up, how it's set up is working as expected. Here are some of the logos of the monitoring tools that we used. Now it's sometimes quite a lengthy process with a lot of back and forth um, of fixing issues as well as especially when we implemented tools that were kind of interconnected with existing services. And eventually we would deploy it to our production environment and we would hope that everything is going like it was supposed to go. Um, but ultimately there was lots of testing involved and we kind of expected things would go wrong. Now, <laughs> and not to just work. Now in the security space, or when I specifically when I talk to people who are implementing our open source um, security scanner Trivi, um, uh, they do things a little bit different. So they would look into different security scanners. Uh, there are lots and lots of different security scanners depending on which space, which kind of tools you're working with, you would want to choose one or the other. So they would look into the types of security scanners that are out there um, that are kind of covering their needs, their scanning requirements, and then they would go ahead and play around with it. So they start, for example, to test out Trivi, to set it up, to perform scans on their existing resources, configure the security scanner, um, mainly by uh, filtering out security issues. So they would say, for example, I only want to see the critical security issues that I can already fix, that already have a fix available, so they are not bombarded with lots and lots of security issues. But all of these, uh, the testing is very much based on their own setup, on their own environment um, to identify identify security issues that they already have in place in their different resources. So they would then test uh, their own resources. They would kind of start fixing them, but it wasn't really, ne it's not usually not really necessary to, to go ahead and fix all of your security issues before you then go ahead and um, deploy the security scanner, for example, in your production environment. Um, so eventually, uh, or Sometimes very quickly people uh, deploy the security scanner in their production environment and then they wait to tell it about more issues in their different services and their different application um, in, in the application stack. And then it would go ahead and fix they are th those different issues. So again, this is very much um, based on the issues that they already have in place in their own resources. And it's kind of for them expected to have lots of issues there. Um, but it's really like it's a linear process of workflow of like I test what I have there and then I go ahead and fix it. Um, now this is just one difference of like that I identified <laughs> uh, working with with in these two different fields, slightly different fields. Um, now there are lots of different differences and that's not just based on my experience, but people that uh, have worked for longer, I guess, in the space uh, have shared and have commented about that uh, within the observability space, you do things quite differently than, for example, in the DevSecOps space. And um, 
here are just some of them that I want to highlight. Uh, one of them is that in the SRE space, you very much focus on a failure culture. The first day that I was working as SRE, I deleted all of our staging environment, um, and they kind of expected that I would do that, exactly. They, were <laughs> they kind of expected that things like this would happen, and from there, we changed our processes so I couldn't do that again, and nobody else was able to do that again uh, based on our different workflows. So we didn't make it more difficult to deploy resources and change resources, we just changed uh, the, the, the process in which it was done, so I couldn't go ahead and, for example, manually delete everything by accident. Um, now, in the DevSecOps space, it's very much based on a success culture of things are set up in a certain way and they are supposed to work their way, and failure is very, it's not really anticipated in, that, in the same way, in a similar way. Now, in the SAE space, we also do a lot of experimentation, ad hoc experimentation. It's encouraged that you try out different things. Um, how you kind of, not, not just how you feel like, but um, to try out different things, different tools, uh, and see how they work, if they improve anything, or um, yeah, and then go ahead and make changes. Uh, now in the DevSecOps space, we talk a lot about processes and protocols that we have in place that we should follow, whether that's uh, policies within our organization or our company, um, or just certain workflows. And there, don't get me wrong, there are definitely reasons for that, and it's definitely something you want to have in place. Um, but it can go to the extent that it can limit the way that we can react to failure. Um, or don't practice failure in the same way that we would do in the SRE space. Uh, now also, as in, when you work on reliability, um, the systems, especially if you use a microservice architecture with maybe sometimes thousands of different components, uh, you perceive your system as quite dynamic, as everly changing, depending on which team is deploying an update. You expect things to change and to not be the same as they were yesterday. Now in the DevSecOps space, and that's also something that's heavily criticized on security scanners, we treat resources quite as static. They are treated as um, the resource exists in a certain way at a single point in time. And that's like you basically take a snapshot of your resources of your configuration file and you scan them from its configurations. Now it doesn't really anticipate that those configurations can change the next minute. And that's similar with other security issues as well. You perform maybe uh, vulnerability scans every six hours of your container image and then see if there are any new vulnerabilities in your, uh, in your application and that's it for the next six hours. And in the meantime, things can change. Now in the SRE space, we perceive it as, as dynamic, as changing, as things can go wrong. Um, or might work unexpectedly differently the next day than they did yesterday, and uh, we are all very confused about it, <laughs> but that's what happens. Um, yeah, and then in the SE space, we also uh, treat humans as a kind of a core component, and the there's a lot of conversation if you go to SRE conferences and similar about how we can optimize uh, our processes and the culture, the SRE culture. It's like a specific kind of, I guess, sub-talk. <laughs> um, and then in the DevSecOps space, uh, we pretty much tell people off for, inter for doing the wrong kind of interactions. I mean, I think everybody here has received at one point or another an email telling them not to click buttons, which is a little bit difficult if you work on your laptop for 10 hours a day um, to, um, yeah, to not click things that you might not be supposed to click. Um, so we try to limit people in the way that they are interacting with their, with their systems. Now, let's move over to chaos engineering. Chaos engineering is a core component um, that I guess more, uh, at slightly more advanced companies uh, in the RC space are um, deploying, are implementing. It's becoming more popular generally. Um, also in the cloud native space, it has become more popular with different projects. Um, so what is chaos engineering? This is a definition taken from uh, a website called The Principles of Chaos Engineering. It's one of the, it's, I think it has been written by one of the people who first started the concept and started building on, on tools in the space. So chaos engineering is a discipline of experimenting on a system in order to build confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions in production. So you see here the experimentation part, that's one of the core components of like, we want to try out different things, we want to have the space to do that. And it also mentions that we want to build confidence. Now confidence is very much a 
human uh, sense <laughs> or um, idea. It's not something we can't really measure confidence, but over time of a trial and failure, we can build higher confidence in our systems. Um, and that's really the, the idea, as well as that when things go wrong unexpectedly, we have trained for those scenarios. And it's not, in, in the Collins engineering space, um, it's not, the issues are not triggered by us but they are, um, it's kind of practice that they are triggered by the or like by different components, different variables in the systems themselves. Now, Cows Engineering has been started by Netflix in uh, 2010. Uh, when they moved to AWS, they wanted to, uh, they, or they saw that lots of their EC2 instances just went poof, and then nobody could access their streaming services, so they built a tool called Cube. Uh, Chaos Monkey, and Chaos Monkey was there to just turn off their EC2 instances and see, okay, what happens if we turn off some of the components in production? Can our system still survive those issues? How much time do I have left? You're okay. Okay, and you tell me. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, and then uh, Chaos Monkey was eventually uh, open sourced in 2014. Um, and it's still there. You can use it to turn off different components. It, there's an adaptation for Kubernetes specifically that's called KubeMonkey uh, that also turns, out different, turns off different components that you might have running. Uh, now, in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, in that ecosystem specifically to Kubernetes, there are also different projects. Uh, one of them is Litmus Chaos, and the other one is Chaos Mesh that people can use and adapt to implement more sophisticated Chaos experiments. So they can, for example, say, um, I know, uh, more, something more uh, related, for example, to the resource request. Let's see what if we uh, change the resource requests of our application, what would happen in our different environments, uh, things like that. So you can set up more sophisticated experiments with, with these other projects, with these more newer projects. Uh, now, <laughs> going back uh, to kind of my, my path and how I ended up looking into cars engineering. Um, so I used to be a site reliability engineer and then changed to work at uh, Aqua Security. Now, simultaneously to most of this timeline, I was doing an online computer science degree because I felt like I felt like doing that. And this year I wrote my bachelor thesis and I was wondering, okay, how can I apply things that I'm interested in uh, to the security space and kind of make this more, um, more of a research and more interesting, I guess, uh, part of, of my work, of my extracurricular work. Um, so I looked into how what happens when we apply cows engineering to security. Uh, that was kind of my original idea. I, want, I was interested in cars engineering, but I was wondering why do people not actually do that to enhance the security? Turns out they actually do. People have thought about that before. So if you look at cars, security cars engineering, you will find different resources, quite different resources as well. So there's a book that just got released uh, this April, last month, on security cars engineering. It's based on uh, a report uh, also released through O'Reilly. Um, also called security cars engineering. Um, and you can even find different conference recordings that are as early as 2016 on security cars engineering, or it's also sometimes called security experimentation because people don't really like to connect um, security and cars together. It makes them kind of freak out. So you will also find different kind of um, different kinds of wordings for it. But there are already resources out there. And there's also one project that was at one point more popular called Cow Slinger. It's now archived on GitHub, but several uh, different companies kind of built their own security cows engineering frameworks based on that uh, open source tool as well. So what is security cows engineering? Uh, the definition from the book is the identification of security control failures through proactive experimentation to build confidence in the system's ability to defend against malicious conditions in production. So what we want to do is we want to test the security boundaries of our setup of our processes. And you can envision it similar to what happened downstairs. So generally, there's a system in place, and we kind of, we, yeah, I thought about it earlier. <laughs> um, uh, there's a system in place, and we expect it usually to work, right? Like usually, uh, there's a process in place, and usually people follow that process. But what it happens if one of, one of the components goes wrong, one of the components doesn't work as expected, we might not have all of the information that we need to follow the process. Um, so we can't actually follow the process anymore. Ah, so <laughs> we have to come up with a new process. And that might create bottlenecks or um, expose us to more issues or we can't deal with existing issues. Um, and 
Security cars engineering is basically there that you can test your security related tooling and processes that you have set up and test them for kind of more extreme use cases, extreme situations, uh, situations that you might anticipate in one way or another in your different environments. And you can see what happens if certain scenarios were to become true. That's ultimately the idea behind it. And I showed you this graphic earlier. Um, it really focuses on your post deployment stage of like what happens if you've set up your application, if it's running like it's supposed to run in your different environments. Um, but how can you be ensured that even then uh, you don't have misconfigurations in place or maybe new security issues just become introduced in one way or another. Maybe somebody made an ad hoc change to your configuration because they wanted to try something out, forgot to revert it. Um, now it's still there. It's becoming a security issue, things like that. Um, so it's very much focused on aspects that your security scanning can't focus on um, because your security scanning, again, is very static. And it's, it's not there to test processes. It's there to test resources at single point in time. Um, I forgot what I wanted to say about this slide. Um, so let's move on to the next. So the key principles of security chaos engineering um, are that it seeks proactive and adaptive learning over reactive patching. If you're in a situation where you are notified about a critical issue and you didn't make any changes, right? So you didn't make any changes to your different, to any of your configurations. You just, uh, you're maybe about to leave work at 4 p.m and there's an alert, oh, there's a new critical misconfiguration issue. And you're like, okay, I don't really know where it's coming from. I don't necessarily know what it is. Uh, now I have to sit down and actually look at my different resources and see, are we affected right now, yes or no? Now in that situation, you probably are not, you, you don't have in mind to actually go ahead and also improve your tooling because you're already maybe in an agitated stage of identifying, is this something that I have to fix now or can I wait until tomorrow morning? Um, so we want to prevent um, to actually be in that situation by proactively identify how our um, tooling, how our processes work in those situations before those situations become true and are not invoked by us. Um, another aspect is the learning culture that we want to start and we want to create in the SAE space. It's very much, um, a, it's, well, it's kind of a space where you can, where, um, I guess any kind of questions are more encouraged versus in the security space, we still have this kind of idea that you should be at a certain level, you should understand things to a certain extent. Um, and it's much more difficult for people who are not necessarily security focused in any way to enter that space, to get started in that space or like using the security tooling. Um, and that's something that I talked a lot about last year, for example, how can people who are usually DevOps um, focus on DevOps related activities, how can they actually get started with, for example, security scanners without having to rely on uh, a security team or similar. Um, then security cars engineering is also focused on building a learning culture around how organizations build, operate, and instrument their systems, which is heavily related of like, how can we identify how our systems currently work? Um, and that's usually done through controlled tests. So when you already know uh, what issue you want to invoke. So you say, okay, you want to, for example, change a network policy. Then you can build a hypothesis. What should happen if a policy changes? Um, and based on that hypothesis, you can then run tests um, and see if that hypothesis is actually true. If it's not true um, and your systems respond differently, you can go ahead and improve the systems. Uh, why we should break our system? Uh, that's heavily related. It's really ultimately to identify our systems uh, safety boundaries before they are exceeded, before they become an issue. Um, how much are we have time? We're good. Okay. How much longer do you have? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's also focused on viewing the system like an attacker would. Usually, especially with uh, security scanning, what we do is we scan specific resources. You would go ahead and, and that's encouraged, right? If you're an engineer and you're um, with shifting left and everything, you're encouraged to scan your own resources, to take care of your own resources, um, even maybe um, creating the um, deployment resources, the configuration files for these resources, and you're encouraged to go ahead and manage them kind of by yourself to a large extent. And that's really focusing um, your entire system as like different compartments, different sections uh, that different people are taking care of. Um, and that's not how an attacker would view your system. They would view it as, an, as a whole, as a collective thing, uh, where they can uh, exploit loopholes in one area to access another part. Um, 
now we also focus in the um, with security cars engineering on uh, kind of or like acknowledging that we run very complex systems and our systems are getting more complex and you won't be able to understand uh, maybe there are some infrastructures with like if you have thousands of different components you won't be un able to understand or picture all of those different moving parts of all of those different components uh, it's just too vast for a single person probably to grasp it eventually and that's also why you want to run security cars engineering experiments and similar to identify the, if there are any loopholes in this complex system so ultimately, a resilient system isn't one that is robust, but one that can withstand failure. Resilience should be thought of as a proactive and perpetual cycle of system-wide monitoring, anticipating disruptions, learning from success and failure, and adapting the system over time. Uh, now, how can you actually implement security cars engineering? You can perform manual changes. So you can, for example, tell one of your junior engineers, go ahead and break things, go wild, see what happens. Uh, <laughs> and um, that would be one way to go about it. The problem with that, if you do ad hoc changes, is that you will have difficulty tracking those changes. So let's say you run hundreds of different container images and you make configuration changes to a sub part of them, but not to the others. How would you keep track which where you made those changes? So that's why uh, performing manual changes is probably not the best way to go about it, if, especially when you want to have automatic rollbacks uh, of your system. Now, what you could do instead is you can adapt existing um, cars engineering projects. So these two litmus cars and cars match, for example, have an SDK available now that you could apply to security issues uh, or like creating security issues in your infrastructure instead of reliability issues. Um, now, I haven't tried that myself, but I think that's based on what I've <laughs> uh, looked into, that's one of the possibilities. Or you could build uh, custom automated components that can uh, introduce uh, those failures. And that's something that I've done um, as part also of my bachelor thesis. I created a, a Kubernetes operator, Kubernetes controller. And what it basically does is it goes into your, it's installed in your Kubernetes environment, in your infrastructure. And what it does, it goes ahead and makes uh, ad hoc misconfiguration, or introduces ad hoc misconfigurations, configuration changes to see what happens if the configuration of your deployment were actually to change. Now here again there's different resources uh, that you could check out if you are interested and that's it from mine. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, th thanks very much, Anais. Um, uh, before we take questions, let me just quickly check. There was a, a couple, uh, there was a question online. Yeah, I think you mentioned something about the versions and the uh, setting the version. So the question mm -hmm. saying on setting a version for an image is a best practice. The question is, isn't this actually not a um, uh, will it security issue if um, as the fixed version will get old um, and will miss patches as the time passes? So I can't speak for other of applications, the applications that you deploy that you run through containers in your Kubernetes workloads. Um, what you can do with containers is you can set the latest tag. Now the latest tag for container images will refer to the latest image, the latest container image of your application that has been pushed to that container registry. What happens if you define the latest tag is that you don't actually know which version is going to run. And in a lot of applications, um, those might be versions that are actually incompatible um, with your other setup. So what you want to do is you want to specify specific version specific container image tags uh, so you know which which images, which version of that container image is is running in your environment. So a lot of times the latest tag is not supposed to be used. Um, also it's as part of your, like there is something called uh, NSA compliance scans that check whether you comply with certain standards that have been defined. It's part of that as well that you don't, you generally don't want to define the latest tag. That's what that relates to. Excellent. Thanks. And there's another question. How do you differentiate security engineering from things like penetration testing or scenario driven testing? It's, I guess it's very, um, it's very interchangeably, like it can be used very interchangeably. Um, with security cows engineering, uh, it's, hmm. so I haven't like, I haven't thought before about that before. My perspective is that um, 
with security college engineering, it's a process of uh, setting up experiments and running them on a continuous basis in an automated way. It's very much focused on um, having your system introduce minor changes over time, uh, very randomly, to your different, and um, so that basically the tool that you've set up is implementing those changes um, and seeing how the system responds without any external interaction as well, uh, to some extent, yeah. Uh, questions from the audience? Hi, uh, so very interesting. Um, I suppose as, as a general um, team in security, um, I'm a security person, I'm a bit worried that when an SRE picks a tool yeah. and runs the tool and then there are no vulnerabilities or just one, um, they're kind of missing tons of false negatives. And so yeah. at the end of the day, I am a bit worried that it's a false sense of security pretty much. I think the opposite is also true. I mean, they, yeah. they can do, and you know, perfect is the enemy of the good, so we need to draw a line somewhere. Yeah. Uh, according to your experience, I mean, it's very interesting that you had both experiences up to this point. Where do both sides draw the line and say, yeah, yeah we accept the false negatives, but this, this tool is doing enough work or is checking yeah. enough things? Yeah, that makes sense. So I guess it's, uh, if we think, for example, about the scenario on Netflix, what they have done, uh, they were pretty much uh, interested in what happens if in different teams, different components of the infrastructure just disappear. Um, can their component, like their section of, that they're running of Netflix, of their application stack, can it still survive um, one component going off. Now they can't, if you have thousands of different containers, thousands of different instances, you can't test all of them, right? You kind of, there might be one or like, or several that if they turn off, they will bring the entire system down and you won't know about it um, because you might not test it, um, just as an extreme case. Uh, so you're not, with Carl's engineering, you're not interested in testing everything, but testing components and seeing how in, how, again, in made up examples, how would your system respond if it's coming from uh, the other side of not being expected, not being invoked, uh, for example, the misconfiguration change, not being invoked by a person who does them internally in a company who does the misconfiguration change, but actually some external or like situational um, that issues are introduced. So it's more of like testing the processes of what happens if they're uh, security issues, if there are networking issues introduced, would our policies actually catch those? If they don't catch one issue, then it's likely that there might be other issues that they are not going to catch. No, it's less interested in testing all of them and more getting an idea and building the infrastructure around it. Is that Anne? More questions <laughs> from Yeah, there's one at the back. Uh, so we talked about two uh, open source projects. So I want to know if it's is there actually to uh, bypass open source security systems um, than closed source ones. I didn't. Sorry, I didn't so, hear the question. Um, so is it easier to bypass open source security systems than closed ones? Because we talked about two open source projects. So I mentioned. You mean these two open source projects that I mentioned? Yeah. In the slide. Yes. Um, I think that's to some extent a separate topic. Of, so these projects that I mentioned are really used to to create uh, to create these experiments to automate these experiments that you want to set up within your infrastructure to implement uh, security experimentation security those those kind of um, guess scenarios of they could happen what what happens if they were true what happens if somebody accidentally makes this configuration change introduces XYZ security issue how would our systems respond that's why you would use these tools to set them up so you can automate the process and also see the changes that they implement so have kind of a trackable record you know whether to bypass open source security or enterprise uh, tools. I think that's a kind of a different conversation. I have my own opinions on that, but I could give, I guess, a whole new presentation about that. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? 